Hello, everybody. Welcome to our virtual ArtWise today with artist Lala Saadi. We're so thrilled to have her here. She's actually joining us from her studio space in Tangier, Morocco, all the way across the world. Um, before we begin, I want to thank our exhibition sponsors. We couldn't do it without their support. And also our very generous ArtWise sponsor, Martha Mackey, for her continuing um, generosity to make this series possible. So Lala, who has a multicultural experience of life by living both in the East and the West, grew up in Morocco, but went on to study drawing and painting in France at the French School of Fine Arts. And she later ended up immigrating to the United States and finished her Bachelor of Fine Arts and Master of Fine Arts, both at the School of the Museum of Fine Arts in Tufts University in Boston. She has resided here and in Morocco in the two decades since that time, and her work is acclaimed internationally. She has had exhibitions across the world, in the US, of course, in Great Britain, Switzerland, Morocco, the United Arab Emirates, China, Hong Kong, and so many more. Her work is collected internationally um, and is in over 50 museum collections at last count, and it is in the Hunter Museum's collection and it has been since I think 2009. So we are so thrilled that we're able to do an exhibition of her work that shows that piece and many more in context and to talk about her experiences and her photography. So please welcome um, Lala. We are so thrilled you're able to join us today, even though uh, COVID has prevented us from being in the same space at the same time. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Nandini. Yes. Hello, everyone. Um, it is my pleasure to be here with you today, even though for a long distance. And I am sorry I wouldn't be able to um, be at the opening of the exhibit as I am kind of stuck in Morocco. We are under lock in the country because of the um, increase in the new cases of COVID in the country. So um, I will just um, present my work and tell you about my process and what really inspired me to, to make this kind of work. So my work really documents my own experience growing up as an Arab woman within Islamic culture, spending my childhood and adolescence in Morocco and living as an adult in Saudi Arabia for many years helped me gain a greater understanding of the importance of architecture, actual, actual, architectural space, sorry, in, our, in Islamic culture. In my photography, I explore this space, whether mentally or physically, and interrogate its role in gender identity making while engaging with centuries of cultural heritage and artistic process, practices. For instance, my images of women embedded in Islamic culture recognize and represent alternative to similar spaces as imagined for women in painting and photography from within the Arab and Muslim worlds. My fusion of calligraphy a sacred art traditionally reserved for men, and henna, an adornment worn and applied only by women, similarly reproduces artistic traditions and every life practices in Islamic culture while transgressing gender roles and the boundaries between private and public spaces. As an artist who also lives and works in the West, I also engage Islamic culture and art from a different perspective. Most notably, my painting and photography challenges stereotypical representation of Arab and Muslim women in the West. My training in painting allows me to directly converse with the Orientalist painters, appropriate notions of the harem and the veil and undermine their distorted and degrading view of the Eastern way of life. Because of this, my work belongs to a new wave that brings Islamic art to a global stage and challenges the idea that Islamic culture 
is remote and exotic. My approach to art in general is an, as in my relation to Islamic art in particular, is deeply rooted in my personal experience. As a Moroccan born artist who lives in London, New York and Marrakesh, as well as traveling frequently in the Arab world, I have became deeply aware of how the culture we so-called Orient and Occident view one another. In particular, I have become increasingly aware of the impact of Western gaze on Arab culture. Although Orientalism most, suggests, most often suggests the 19th century European vision of the East as a set of assumptions it lives on today, both in the gaze of the West and the way Arab societies continue to internalize and respond to that gaze. Because in its early form, Orientalist was literal vision finding expression in the work of Western painters who traveled to the exotic East in search of, cult of cultures more colorful than their own, I have used it as the point of departure in much of my own work. The imagery I found in Orientalist paintings has resonated with me in tricky ways. And it ultimately helped me situate my own experience in a powerful visual language. As I address you today, I am hoping this complex of ideas we call Orientalism as reflected in my work and in the Western painting that inspire it would serve to ground my remarks. While the overtly sensational and often sexualized Images commonly found in Orientalist representation of the East appears nowadays replaced in the form of a more subtle signifier of difference. The legacies of the early depiction of the Arab world still inform contemporary Western perception of the region. These historic images also continue to influence in way in ways in which contemporary artists like myself construct our own identity, sometimes working in strict opposition to reductive stereotype, sometimes appropriating Orientalist imagery in order to subvert yet deeply held cultural expectations. In a world in which many of the Orientalist tropes continue to dominate contemporary depictions in film and popular media and often set the terms for political analysis. My work aims to provide viewers with an understanding of the history of these visual and the tools to rearrange critically the narratives they support. However, I would like to begin by emphasizing that my relationship the Orientalist tradition is a complicated one. I am able to appreciate the beauty Western painters found in Morocco, Egypt, and in other Arab countries, which they rendered in such a loving detail. And at the same time, I cringe at the distorted and degrading views of the Eastern way of life as portrayed in their work and most strikingly in their representation of Arab women. I can simultaneously regret how their demeaning imagery in, imprinted itself on the societies they depicted. At the same time, believe that we, we are all responsible for freeing ourselves from imposed identities and seeing ourselves with our own eyes. Finally, before embarking on the presentation of my work and its relation to the Orientalist tradition, let me just note that I am an artist and that my work is inspired by personal history. The many territories that converge in my work are not only geographical ones, but territories of the imagination shaped above all by childhood and memory, by invisible influences. I cannot presume to speak for all Arab women, and my work cannot be reduced to 
an Orientalist discourse. Orientalism has given me a lens through which to focus on the converging territories of my work and through which to see clearly the influence of Western imagination in the Eastern way of conceptualizing the self. At a more personal level, my creative practice is a means through which I could reinvent myself and position myself in the past and the present, as well as in different cultural contexts. This entails a revision of my own narratives as I confront multiple, sometimes contradictory standpoints. But let me return the farther back in my journey I believe that it is important to remember that I have spent much of my life in the Muslim world where women were expected to maintain traditional gender roles as daughters, sisters, and ultimately as wives and mothers. I followed this path for many years, first as a, a daughter and later a wife and a mother. I believe my work with it's very intimate portrayal of Moroccan women in their private spaces they inhabit would not have been possible without distancing myself from my own homeland. My work is haunted by space, actual and metaphorical. My photographs grow up of the need I felt to document actual spaces, spaces of my childhood. At a certain point, I realized that in order to go forward as an artist, it was necessary to return physically to my childhood home and to document this world, which I had left in a physical sense, but of course, never fully in any deeper, more psychological one. In order to understand the woman I had become, I needed to re-encounter the child I once was. I needed to return to the culture of my childhood if I wanted to understand my unfolding relation to the converging territories of my present life. This culture and the space of my childhood within it was defined for me by specific domestic spaces, ones which still exist but are in the process of slowly deteriorating. Because of this, I decided to document through photography, these physical spaces before they were lost, and in so doing, reflect on the role they played in shaping the metaphorical space of my childhood. The house I returned to is now an occupied space, a space of memory, but returning here, I discovered another space, the one which I inhabit now, that of an artist. I was bringing with me the new perspective of having lived in the West and the only space in which these different territories, East and West, past and present, could be brought together was the internal space of the imagination, the space of self-creation. My process in creating my photographs is in many ways as important to me as any final product could have been. Put differently, it is my hope that the process is reflected in the product, in the series itself. My hope all in, in all my work has been to draw together the personal and cultural trends of my experience in a way that is transformative for me, for the women I work with, and if possible, for the viewer as well. Work, work on these pieces starts several months in advance of the actual shooting with the process of writing on the fabric that covers the walls, furniture, and women's clothing. Although I've occasionally had help, I do most of the writing myself, which is a lot of work. I need to have a larger surplus of fabric on hand when I start the shoot because the henna flicks off each time the women move. This means rewriting on the fabric after each photograph. I welcome the time I spend involved in the process of such labor-intensive art making. 
And I welcome the time involved for it is in the process itself that discoveries are made, change in perceptions occurs, and new forms of self-expression emerge. Converging territory series is set in Morocco in this large and occupied house belonging to my family. Until fairly recently, my work was preoccupied with this space. This house is both a literal and a psychological space, one that is marked by memory. Creating these photographs was performative. I used family acquaintances as models. Applying henna is a very painstaking process and cannot be interrupted. So the models were enabled to rest sometimes for long, long hours. I do everything I can to make the process easy on them. So they won't be bored. We play music and tell stories. And we only proceed after a day spent rehearsing. So they know exactly what to expect. It is obvious that why my photographs express my personal history and experience, they can also be taken as reflection on the life of Moroccan women in general. Even though I am uncomfortable thinking of myself as a representative of all Arab women, there are continuities within Arab and Islamic cultures that can be reflected in the work of individual artists. And I am much too aware of the range of traditions and laws among the different Arab nations to presume to speak for everyone. My work documents my own experience growing up as an Arab woman within Islamic culture seen now from a very different perspective. It is the story of my quest to find my own voice. It is with this unique voice that I attempt to express the complexities of the world I live in. In Les Femmes du Maroc, the mothers were Moroccan women living in Boston and thus like me, they were living the dual condition that is diaspora, living in another culture, but symbolically marked by our homeland. We chose to engage the language and material associated with traditional Arab and Islamic art as part of a negotiation of identity. Looking back to our point of connection, we found new patterns formed in the metaphors of absence and presence, nearness and distance, and in continuous dialogue between East and West and Western art. As I mentioned earlier, my work reaches beyond Islamic culture as it is also invokes the Western fascination with the odalisk, the veil, and of course the harem as it is expressed in Orientalist painting. Orientalism has long been a source of fascination for me. My background is in art, in painting, and it is as a painter that I began my investigation into Orientalism. My study led me to a much deeper understanding of the painting space so beautifully addressed by the Orientalist painters in Troll to Arab Decor for its terrific prominence of interior space in Arab Islamic culture. And finally, of course, I became aware of the patterns of cultural domination and predatory sexual fantasy encoded in Orientalist painting. Let us return to the term I might have touched on a moment ago, the concept of threshold. This relationship between architectural and psychological boundaries in Arab country cultures. It is important to note that women's sexuality in the Arab world has determined the very nature of public and private space. Arab women traditionally occupy a private space but whenever a woman uh, is, when a man enters that space, he establishes it as a public. This separation of public and private is a testament to the power of women's sexuality. 
It also helps explain how Arab women became sexualized under the Western gaze. In a sense, what the West did was to dissolve the boundaries between private and public. And here is the important point. The Arab world responded by reinstating those boundaries in a way that would be clear and visible by veiling women behind the veil an Arab woman maintains a private space, even in public. Jerome's slave market is a particular flagrant example of the private made public. It destroys the traditional boundaries of architecture and culture. In addition to depicting a naked woman in a public space, the painting itself was shown in public exhibitions at galleries and museums. When we look at this painting, we see behind the naked central figure in the painting, there is a woman hidden behind the veil. She became something to be unwrapped for presentation as a sort of prize. Jerome takes what a in a domestic sense would be a private moment of unveiling and creates a public act. This public unveiling of the slave market is an act of commodification of economy. The public unveiling of the slave market is thus an act of commodification and of economy. In the slave market, Jerome painted an alternative to the Victorian social structure in which sexuality was divided into three categories, the wife, the prostitute, and the servant, the wife as a representative of femininity and fertility, the prostitute of sexuality, and the domestic of service, sexliness and loyal service. In response to these rigid sex division of the West, Jerome, like other Orientalists, painters blurred the boundary between femininity and sexuality in the depiction of the East. If European wives were to be pure, then painters turned to Eastern women to fulfill their sexual fantasies. Of course, in order to do so, these women had to be depicted as white and upper class in appearance. Arab men, on the other hand, are presented as swarthy suggests, and suggest a brutality from which these vulnerable women need to be rescued. This barbarism leaves the women free for abduction by the viewer's gaze, since she is mismatched with the Arab male who is her obvious inferior, then she becomes a male, she must be desired to be saved by Western viewer. The slave market then becomes a male fantasy. It satisfies the European male desire for a woman who is neither a Victorian wife nor a commercial prostitute. The woman in the slave market painting is submissive, yet she's not restrained physically, making possible the fantasy she may enjoy or welcome the sexual act. At the same time, she is being sold. So fantasies of rape and sexual force can be put into play. However, she is not dehumanized by any violence. And the, the fingers of the buyer in her mouth indicate a type of sexual openness. They are also the idea that the buyer who wears the best clothing in a Western is a Western man and is thus the only one worthy of owing, subduing the woman. The only white man, the only other white man is a beerless, beerless youth, obviously not in his manhood. The dark skinned man who sells her then becomes emblematic of all Arab men, brutal and attractive and of a lower status than the white skinned woman he sells. Jerome's painting and, Odalis, and the odalisque I mentioned earlier provide a kind of foil for my own work, which set to evoke, interrogate, and complicate the Orientalist tradition. 
In so doing, I hope to make possible within the projected space of Orientalist painting, a new space, an openness to a new kind of understanding. In my photographs, I hope to help the viewer to see Orientalism as a projection, projection of the sexual fantasies of Western male artists and as a voyeuristic tradition. However, I also invite viewers to appreciate the authentic beauty of the culture depicted. What these artists discovered when they came to our shores was a world filled with exquisite beauty in the architecture, the decorative surfaces, the fabric, the women's clothing. They saw this juxtapose to their own subdued bourgeois culture and their reaction validated its beauty. However, the Orientalist vision holds ultimately a dangerous beauty. It lures the viewer into accepting the fantasized slave status of the women depicted in the harems and slave markets. The question for me becomes how to reclaim the authentic beauty, how to separate the beauty of the rooms, the fabric and so forth from that of women themselves so seemingly passive and receptive, much, much like the furniture or the welcoming spaces. Harem, Harem Siri, the final installment of the My Serial Triptych, is a continuation of both converging territories and Les Femmes du Maroc, in that, that I give attention to the odalisk, the veil, and especially the harem spaces. In the exploration of these beautiful spaces of confinement, I return to the rich color and architectural features that I purposely stripped from previous two series. Instead, harem is marked by an emphasis on architecture and ornamentation, which evokes an immediacy and presence in reality as opposed to abstracted spaces of the imagination. This series originated in 2009 at a time when I was in the process of reorienting myself toward Morocco in mind, spirit, and creative practice. Though I have always returned home to see my family, it was more as a visitor than resident. Spending time in Marrakesh allowed me to pose and reconsider Morocco as home in the present, rather than simply a place of my past. This reorientation manifests itself in Harem, in which I revisited my origins, this time with a new independence I had not previously, previously associated with my homeland. As in each previous series, Harim occupies a distinctive historical frame, actually actively confronting, I actively confront Moroccan's fraught political past and the cultural practice of confinement by staging the photographs in the resplendent Dar el Basha Palace located in Marrakesh. Dar el Basha has a, a little bit about this space. It is a very interesting space to photograph in. It was once owned by a man called Tamil Glawi, a very controversial figure who was made the Pasha of Marrakesh in 1912 by the Moroccan king. It was at the beginning of the colonial period of Morocco and El Glawi supported the French rule. And because of this, he's a very controversial figure today. He actively worked against the Moroccan king and encouraged the French to exile him during the colonial period. Glawi led a very decadent lifestyle and held lavish parties in this mansion, which interestingly enough, included such internationally known 
figures such as Winston Churchill and Charlie Chaplin. When I photographed this palace, it was closed for many years but was in the process of being converted into a museum. And today it is a museum. The splendid place recalls visual architecture elements and informed 19th century Orientalist paintings. The beauty of the setting belies the, its lurid history. The Tamil Gawi ruled Marrakesh as a rootless this part with the various with the voracious appetite for women and Darl Basha serves as the residence of the Pasha and his seizable harem. I deliberately selected this location, now a national museum, has allowed for a deeper engagement with Moroccan as a national space. The palace harem embodies those envisioned by 19th century Orientalist painters who had to rely on speculation and fantasy. By contrast, I captured the harem in a more immediate fashion, informed by a specific space and its fraught history rather than by my personal memory or imagination. In harem series, I emphasize or rather I overemphasize spectacular architecture, and that threatens to subdue the women. I replicate decorative elements on clothes and surround the women in the space. In so doing, women became as ornamental as the house and dissolved into its ornate patterns. Even in the context of the dominating architecture, however, women are not overshadowed. In harem number two and the second image of the series, I highlight the woman at the center of the vast architecture space that dominates in harem number one. Though they share an identical element, the women pose, posed within each extreme and it's in harem series, I emphasize, or rather I overemphasize spectacular architectures that threatens to sub subsume the women. I replicate decorative element on clothes and surround the, the women in the space. In doing so, women became as ornamental as the house and dissolve into its ornate patterns. Even in this context, the dominating architecture, however, women are not overshadowed. In harem number two, in the second image in the series, I highlight the women at the center of the vast architecture space that dominate in harem number one. Though they share an identical element, the women pose with each extreme in its own way. One captures the vast space, the other a very intimate portrait. Harem revisited, I use Moroccan dresses borrowed from the collection of Noor and Bukhar Temli. Urban women commonly wore these type of dresses that you see here called kaftans for weddings and other celebratory occasions. And people still wear them today in Morocco. What I did is I took individual kaftans from the collection and I dressed my models in innovative ways. I hope to make a statement by turning something old into something new. So my photographs are not meant to be a recreation of the past. Rather, I drew from my love of fashion and I layered the kaftans in new ways. And these combinations would not have been worn by women today or even in the early 20th century when the garments were, were originally made. Kaftans such as these were worn by women from urban cities, centers of cities such as Fez, Meknas and Marrakesh. The embroidered brocade patterns 
with flowers seen in these kaftans. So my photographs are not meant to be a recreation of the past, rather I drew from my love of fashion and I layered the kaftan in new ways. And these combinations would not have been worn by women today or even in earlier 20th century when the garments were originally made. Kaftans such as these were worn by women from the urban centers of cities such as Fez, Mekna, and Marrakesh. The embroidered brocades patterns with flowers seen in, on the kaftan drive from 19th century silk from Lyon, France, that was used for religious garments. And over time, each city in Morocco developed its own embroidery. This one, the photograph, for instance, the composition is filled by a bridal, a bride trousseau. I combine different patterns and different embroidery styles from different cities to create interior spaces that exist outside the time and cannot be linked to a specific place, creating unique stage sets. So back to the Orientalism, interestingly, it is not only the West that has been prevented from seeing Arab culture currently. How people in the Arab world see themselves has also been affected by the distorted lens of Orientalism. There is some evidence that the Orientalist perspective has had an impact on the actual lives of Arab men and women and especially that the rules for Arab women became much stricter as a result of Western influence. When the West portrays Eastern women as victims and Eastern men as depraved, the effect is to emasculate Eastern men and to challenge the traditional values of honor and family. As a result, Arab men feel the need to be even more protective of Arab women, preventing them from being targets of fantasy by veiling them. By invoking the Orientalist tradition in a way that makes the viewer aware of its inherent, inherent assumptions, I hope not to provoke some kind of blame game, but rather to liberate viewers Arab and Western alike, from the grip of these assumptions. Furthermore, I'm not a sociologist. I'm an artist working from a particular vintage point. And as such, I hope to give full expression to a uniqueness that I hope will resonate with the uniqueness of each viewer. My latest project, Bullets and Bullets Revisited, in a sense flows from my own previous work. It too addresses the polarization between East and West and the way in which in the East, we in the East have to a limiting effect allowed the Western gaze to imprint itself on, a, on our view of ourselves. This new work, however, situate itself explicitly in a post-Arab spring Clearly, Arab Spring had given many people the courage to come out in public and demand with strength what they believe is right for them. In this series, I used bullet shells that came on comment on violence that many in the US and also in Europe associate with contemporary Middle Eastern, Middle East and North Africa. I transform bullets into sparkling garment, intricate backdrops, so you can't really recognize them as weaponry anymore. As you can see, I create intricate patterns. I work with people who can cut and polish used um, bullets cases and cut them into slice. And I began the process of weaving thousands of these shells together. So for Bullet Revisited, for instance, 
some several hundreds. So for bullets revisited number 20, for instance, some several hundred pounds used to create this woman's clock. This clock was so heavy, I had, to, I had the clock picked up and placed carefully on the woman's shoulders after the woman was sitting down. And as soon as the photograph was taken, the clock was removed carefully. It is in the form what we call in Morocco a selham. A selham is a clock that worn by men. Recognizing the, of the reused fabric and material to demonstrate the creative nature of my photography, each photograph is the result of a long creative process of design and of organization, plan, planning and reflection. My point, my pointed determination and attention to detail. Each photograph reflects different stylization and involve actions and thought of my part and that of my models. I like to play with decisions between high and low capture using recycled materials and transforming them into high art. This aspect of my photographs, as well as their narrative, quality, their fashion sense, this is all by design. I'm aware that North African women's body historically served as a voyeuristic site of otherness during colonial period. And this work portrays both the invasive role of violence and the threat of violence now heightened by the West fear of terrorism. It also looks to respond to the current trend in the Arab world of seeking refuge in Islamic culture and belief. Islam provided a powerful message of peace and can be seen as a potential antidote to the violence of extremism. However, like any religion, Islam can also be used as an escape a withdrawal from today's complexities and an excuse for constraining women in an attempt to protect the private domestic space. In today's Morocco, there seems to be a growing need to take shelter in a very clearly defined Arab identity, an identity shaped by a newly anti-Western -West fatalistic and religious mindset. One frequently encountered the complete veil and the beard, neither of which was a common sight in Morocco. Morocco has long prided itself on its ability to adapt to modernity, to embrace progress without sacrificing its own deeply rooted traditions. However, lately a sense and an easiness and ambiguity and in my work, I wish to make visible the fear and impulse towards, towards self-protection that have provoked this reaction. My goal is to hold up a mirror in which people can see themselves, both in fear and in hope. In today's Morocco, there seem to be a growing need to take shelter in a very clear defined Arab identity an identity shaped by a newly anti Western fatalistic and religious mindset. One frequently encountered the complete, complete veil and the beard, neither of which was a common sight in Morocco until recently. Morocco has long prided itself on its ability to adapt to modernity, to embrace progress, without sacrificing its own deeply rooted traditions. However, lately I sense uneasiness with such ambiguity and in my own work, I wish to make visible the fear and impulse towards self-protection that have provoked this reaction. My goal is to hold up a mirror in which people can see themselves both in fear and in hope. Both traditional Orientalism and today's withdrawal into the false security of a simplified repressive past destroys the lives of women and deprive them these lives of value. 
this gender apartheid is not about piety. It is about dominating, excluding, and subordinating women. It is about barring them from political activities, preventing their active participation in the public, public sector, and making it difficult for them to fully exercise the rights Islam grants them to own and manage their own property. After they played a major role in the Arab Spring throughout the Middle East and North Africa, women today are experiencing tyranny in varying degrees all over the Arab world. Some regimes hide their agenda better than others. Thank you. Thank you, Lala. That was really terrific. Thank you. Um, since you've lived um, for so many years in both the Middle East and in Europe and in the United States, and you've exhibited in both areas of the world and others, how do you find the perception of this work in one part of the world versus another? Uh, it's a very interesting question. Thank you. Um, I, first of all, my experience is, uh, for instance, um, not so much now as in the beginning of my exhibitions in, in Europe and maybe not Europe, but in the United States, I found that I had to explain my background, to explain the culture, to explain for people to understand the kind of work I do. In, uh, when I'm in Europe, and we're talking about Orientalism, more of these Orientalist painters are actually from Europe. So, um, and the French have been, and the British, the colonized part of the world, most of that region. So um, they understand the work. So their reaction is different. And um, their reaction wasn't always, you know, like they feel that uh, I'm being very, um, how can I put it, um, that I am negative about such work from masters such as the, the Orientalists. And I remember um, I was having an exhibition in United States and one and the curator contacted uh, this gallery that on one of the Orientalist painting, he wanted to, um, to have one of that picture being hanged within the exhibition. Uh, just a picture of the painting. He wasn't asking for the painting itself. And um, the gallerist completely refused. He was like, no, we're not going to allow Lala to have that because she has a very negative attitude toward the Orientalist. So for me, it was, it was interesting because uh, I told that now contemporary people are starting to understand that it was wrong to to make such work, you know, mm -hmm. in another country. And that reaction just showed me that it wasn't the case. So, and there was, there was another journalist once, he was like, um, you have to admit that we flatter your color, your culture in this mm -hmm. painting, you know, mm -hmm. like it, it just, it makes it very difficult because these people are not even open to a dialogue to talk about something like this. They still, still seeing us as um, the colonized and uh, it's very problematic. Um, in the Arab world, it's a different reaction altogether. Mm -hmm. There is some sense that um, I betray the, the country, I betray the culture because I'm showing women in their private spaces to Western world and I'm not doing anything different than what these Orientalists are doing. So. Um, there was a lot of negativity <laughs> when it came to my work because it disturbed people. They don't want to face the truth. And I knew that was going to happen when I embarked on such a project. And until today, you know, like uh, recently I was talking with this author and he was fascinated by my painting and my painting includes a lot of nudity and he comes from the Middle East, you know, like, and he was a man and he was encouraging me to do it, mm -hmm. to paint more and to, um, and I said, they would not even look at it because when they saw my painting earlier, they just started labeling me that I am working with pornography. 
um, okay. it's it's a very yeah it was very difficult and um, it's a bit uh, isolating. Mm -hmm. uh, people are worried to talk to me about, you know, something uh, when I'm in Morocco, for instance, or they're always afraid that I'm going to use whatever they're going to tell me into my art and expose them in such a way. So it's, it's very challenging. So do you find that women have a different perception of the work than men? Um, interestingly enough, women were actually harder on me than men. Okay. Yeah, okay. in certain part of the world. I'm not talking in Morocco, no. In Morocco, at the beginning, they, they didn't understand what I'm doing. It took a few years for them to understand that um, I use stereotypes in my work to actually address that, and they didn't understand that at the beginning. But they're in, in Morocco, they are quite actually, um, they're very supportive because they know what I'm trying to do. In the Middle East, and especially in the media, and it was very, uh, women were not very supportive at all. Mm. They were very harsh on their criticism of my work more than men. But, you know, like um, in some part of the world, we know how brainwashed women can be. And that's exactly what, that was the case you know, like very conservative women are saying that I'm not a Muslim, I'm working and showing women and showing their skin. And so it was a little bit difficult, but I think that's part of, of the work. You know, when you do something that disturbs, you will have people against you and against the work. So, yeah. Well, I it, it is so beautiful and then you when the more you look at it the more the substance reveals itself at first it just draws you in for its pure beauty and color and form um so we i know we're going to get some process questions um in the exhibition and you explained quite a bit of it in your talk um for converging territories on the pieces that are the bullets, which is the series you're still, I think, exploring, yes. um, how do you uh, get the bullets and how do you attach them together? You said something about weaving as you were talking. Right, and I was showing one slide. Usually I don't show slides from the process, but because of that question that you can see within that slide, that's how, um, I have the bullets and it's cut in half because okay. of, they are very tall mm -hmm. and I make the holes into the bullets, into the shells. And through the shells, through these holes, I attach them together with very thin wire. Oh. So it's the weaving, yeah. And you can see it in that slide very well, you know, like because you see how it became a cloth and I was turning it and you can see also the uh the wire and uh, in the process you know like they are like necklaces that i put so they are four holes so when you have one from here then you can have and the other side so right. they, you can attach them into that but they are so tiny mm -hmm. that you know like it's really a long time it takes a very long time to make the the clock with it and I can't find it in Morocco because I work with the specific uh, shells like um, the 22 caliber. Okay. And that's uh, in the United States, you find it in, you can buy it, of course, but I, I use, I like to use the one that's been used. So mm -hmm. what I do, I send people into these shooting boots and we just, we buy them by the bucket and we sort them because they're all kind of, of shells, you know, like you have the big ones, the small ones. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, then we made a special uh, jig to cut them and cut them by the hundreds. Otherwise mm -hmm. it, takes, it takes very long time to get everything together. And then I work with them, I make them into small pieces and then bring them to Morocco and put them together to create the cloth, to create the dress, to create, you know, and because I can't find many, I have to recycle them. Mm 
Mm -hmm. It took me mm -hmm. a year to make that cloth. And as soon as the photo was taken, I had to undo that and use it in something else. And I'm working on a dress now that it took me two years and it's not complete. <laughs> I know it's a long book. Uh, so um, I was, um, I wanted to send all these to Morocco. That was few months ago because of COVID, I had to send it first to Belgium because then I had the transporter who can bring it to Morocco without having to go through customs and everything because it's also, it's complicated. They don't allow me to bring it. Uh, and so it was stuck there for six months. It arrived last week. So I'm very happy it's here. In Morocco, I use, um, you, you can buy bullet shells, but you can only buy the big ones for hunting. And okay. uh, you have to have a special permit for that. So it's, it's a long process, but it's, it's actually quite amazing. I, love, I, I, I enjoy, you know, taking time to do things. It doesn't matter how long it takes when I have an idea and I want to do it. Uh, I oh. know that. Yeah, all, all of your work from the beginning, I think, has been very process driven. I mean, right. writing henna for weeks, and months. Yeah. So. I think also it comes from the background of painting. I need that time, you know, with the work itself and with the painting. It's not like photography. When I photograph, it takes a few days and it's done. But the process of creating those sets are the time that I enjoy most you know, because I spend more time with my work doing that. So, well, and that's almost performative by the time you uh, create the, the costumes, the sets, uh, collaborate with your sitters. Um, have you ever thought about, or have you been also doing filming or film work? I did one uh, film, a 16 millimeter, that was shown actually in my retrospective in, in Washington, D.C. is a, a film of a child being initiated into wearing the veil. And it mm -hmm. was done in this old house. And I used my niece and she's, she's already 15. I can't believe she was only like three or four years old. Um, I wanted I wanted to do film in the beginning, but uh, somehow I just fell in love with photography, and I think it's it's just perfect for the kind of work that I have to do in Morocco and bring to United States. Um, uh, it's the time I spend with these women, and just, uh, it's the whole thing. I think it's. Um, photography for me and and also it's not only any photography I'm not using digital cameras not that I'm saying anything against them eventually I will use them mm -hmm. uh, because it's very hard to find film nowadays and um, so much equipment I have to carry and uh, but I like that process of using the lighting, the heavy cameras, this, the whole performance. You talked about the performance. I think the performance is not only in making in the process, but it, when I'm with these women, when we spend so uh, long together uh, in these spaces and um, it's, there is some kind of celebration in it. It's exhaustive. It's, you know, like I, I film until very late at night and um, usually after a shoot, I have to stay in bed for 48 hours. That's how exhausted it is. Uh, but um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to do it differently. You know, like it's, it's really wonderful. Well, I so appreciate you joining us all the way across the world and taking so much time to do this. Um, and um, we are thrilled that you were able to do it. And I want to. Thank all our guests who are viewing this at home uh, again for joining us and please come see the exhibition at the museum. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me.